The first question is, what has most contributed to each of you becoming wise yourself? Mm. <laughs> well, <laughs> should, 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 should a wise person even take on that, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, quite, uh, name? Uh, probably not, but still, let's say uh, what has helped become a little wiser. Uh, I feel more, much more comfortable answering that question. Uh, and of course, there are a mul multitude of things. Firstly, uh, I've been the beneficiary of be having the extraordinary good fortune of being around uh, and being able to meet and be with a number of wise people. And partly I've looked very hard for that. I've gone around the world as part of my personal and professional search to look for wise people and to try to learn from them. So that has been very important. And just how important I think can be demonstrated by a, a fact, and that is I spent three years writing a book called Essential Spirituality, The Seven Central Practices, in which I was, I was searching for the answer to the question, what have the wisest people have ever lived said are the essential qualities of heart and mind for us to cultivate? And how do they recommend doing that? And so that was, you know, seemed a really intriguing and very important question. So it took me three years of research to answer that. And what surprised me most was that every one of the great traditions said that every, for every single one of the seven qualities they emphasized, for wisdom, for love, for, for insight, for concentration, for service, every one of these qualities, they said, if you want to develop this quality, hang out with people who have it. So the general theme across traditions and centuries has been that consciousness is catchy and that if you want to develop certain qualities, hang out with people who have them. So that's been one thing that I've felt very grateful for. And primary among that has been my relationship with my wife, who is by any standard a very wise soul. And I feel very, very fortunate to have that kind of relationship in which there's been a shared commitment to learning and growth. And the relationship itself has been the container and catalyst for mutual learning, exploration, and hopefully a little wisdom. So that. Then also, I had the extreme good fortune of going into psychotherapy with a remarkable man by the name of Jim Bugenthal, a humanist existentialist, who was truly a wise human being, and who introduced me to the fact that there was an inner universe as vast and mysterious and as important as the outer one. And made me realize that I'd lived my entire life on the top, what felt like the top six inches of a wave on top of an ocean and in an ocean where I didn't even know existed. So a wise therapist was extraordinarily helpful to me, life-changing. And then uh, I've been very fortunate in being able to explore a variety of contemplative traditions, uh, being able to spend time uh, both in study, intellectual study, but more importantly in contemplative practice in a variety of both Eastern traditions, Buddhism, yoga, uh, Taoism, and Eastern traditions, Christian contemplation, uh, Sufic practices, some of the Jewish Kabbalistic practices, all of these have contributed enormously to my appreciation of uh, the wisdom that is available to us all and that's available for us to imbibe to the extent we do the practices they recommend. So all of these, these have been very valuable. And of course, life itself is the great teacher. And uh, you know, unless we're in a monastery, if we're truly wanting to live fully and well, then we're probably going to be practicing karma yoga, karma yoga being the discipline of using one's work and action in the world as the medium and catalyst for one's 
in a growth and maturation. So life itself, of course, is the great call and <laughs> the great teacher. So all of those I would point to as, uh, as wonderful gifts that have been given me and that uh, most of which are available to all of us if we, if we look.